Uh, hello, welcome to English Literature. Uh, today, in this lecture, we will discuss Eliot's tradition and the individual talent as has been uh, requested by a friend from abroad and uh, many others. I'm Joydeep Chakravarti, as you know uh, by now, and thank you very much for being with us and making the dialogues very engaging. Now, uh, this year, 2020 or 2020, is just a hundred years of the publication of uh, tradition and the individual talent. Mm, technically speaking, this is the second publication that I have in mind because initially it was published in 1919. Okay, then, uh, then it was pub published as part of a collection of essays, The Sacred Wood, in 1920. So, that is known as the more authentic publication, so this year, 2020. Now, if we look at this title carefully, we get most of the meanings that he wants to assert, actually, at least in the first part of the essay. The essay has three parts. First part is his definition of tradition. Second part is more about individual talent or actually his definition of poetry. Some people have called it his poetic manifesto and uh, perhaps this is not incorrect. And the third part is conclusion. Now tradition and the individual talent, these things seem contradictory because whenever we say tradition, that is, uh, this is a lot of uh, hue and cry about tradition. You know, we must uh, remain true to our tradition, true to our culture, true to our heritage, etc., etc. We keep saying. Uh, but then, if that is so, how can there be individual talent? That is, everyone will have to follow set patterns given by one's tradition. So, the space of individual talent is very limited, isn't it? But that is not what Eliot means by uh, tradition, Eliot's idea of tradition. Tradition, true, it's true, Eliot says, it's a thing of the past, but it is as much a thing of the past as of the present, and it is not a fossilized or static thing. It gets changed. I will give you a simple example. Till the age of Shakespeare, what would have been the tradition of English literature? Say, Chaucer, uh, Spencer maybe by extension Dante, etc. But in the Victorian age, if we talk about the tradition of English literature or if in that age some poet wanted to take into consideration the tradition of English literature, will it end with Spencer only? No, it will take Shakespeare, then all the 17th and 18th century poets, writers. So you see tradition is an ever-changing thing. So even tradition, uh, t uh, you know, in itself is not a fixed or static thing. That is where most common people go wrong. Whenever there is any change from such pattern, we get alarmed. Oh, no, 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 this uh, should not be done. This is not in our tradition. So we object to new kind of interpretation of religion or new things in society. Uh, take the case of legalization of homosexuality in India. It faced a lot of protests for a very long period of time. Uh, until 2018, I mean it was passed. The main argument was it is not in our tradition. So, in the same way, now gay marriage is not being recognized uh, by the authorities, though the court has uh, shown some sympathy, because it is not in our tradition. So, we believe that whatever is there in tradition should be there. But that way, many things, and even the smartphone, aeroplane, so many things are not in our tradition. So, the idea of tradition that we have, common people have, is very limited, in a way fossilized, but at the same time, hypocritical. Eliot is not in favor of that kind of an idea of tradition. Tradition for him is a continuum of good poets, writers, and cultural figures of a particular society, and it keeps changing. He says the past influences the present. Obviously, today, if you are writing a poem, if you are an educated person, 
you think about the poems that you have read in English, at least Eliot, Shakespeare, those things will come in your mind. So you will try to surpass them or be like them. At one stage, initially, people try to be imitative when they start writing. And <clears throat> later, they try to be different. But anyway, so past is not only past, it is present. And at the same time, just as a new poet or new writer publishes his writings, he also alters the present. Uh, sorry, the past. Is not it? As I gave the example earlier, that with the addition of each new poet, each new writer, the tradition of English literature or what we know as English literature is getting changed. So there is enough scope for the individual talent to alter traditions as much as the tradition influences it. See, Wordsworth, William Wordsworth. Now he is a part of the English tradition, a traditional poet. But when Wordsworth was writing, he went against the dominant tradition of neoclassical poetry. Again in the Victorian age, uh, the poets went against Wordsworth and the other romantics and that vein also he get in Eliot. He was not in favor of the romantics. To that we will come now. In the second part of the essay, he makes a uh, by the way, I hope what he has tried to indicate by tradition and individual talent is clear. Individual talent is your own talent, a writer's or a poet's or every individual's own talent. And tradition is what already exists. These two are not mutually antithetical, mutually exclusive, but one informs the other. I have explained lucidly with examples, I believe. Now, in the second part, he starts with a very important proclamation that... Uh, sincere criticism is directed upon the artist, sorry, upon art, not the artist. So therein lies his theory of impersonality of poetry. We, in the subcontinent especially, till that we suffer from this personality problem, we are always focused on the personality. For example, uh, so many movies we want to watch, not because we love the plot or something, but because our favorite actors like Amitabh Bachchan, Shah Rukh Khan or whatever are acting there. This is a general example of personality approach, person-centered approach. But you should not be focused on the actor actually. On the, you should be focused on the role that the actor plays in that play. And in the given play, whoever plays his or her role best deserves our attention. But we don't have that kind of critical sense. So, like... Uh, say if Shakespeare is great so anything written by Shakespeare must be great that is a faulty approach according to Eliot obviously this is close affinities with new criticism as you know new critics like I.A. Richards Eliot's contemporary he ex made experiments in his classroom he gave students poems on pieces of paper to write critical appreciation. So when the names of the poets were given, they wrote one kind of thing. And then later when he did the same experiment without giving the name of the poet, uh, they could not find those. This Google was not there. So there were radically different and better interpretation. Why? Because as soon as you know the name of an author or a writer, you are overpowered by his name, fame, etc. So, if you know a poem is written by Wordsworth, you haven't read it, but you know it is written William Wordsworth, and if I ask to appreciate it, uh, you know, 10, 20 lines you will say about Wordsworth's love of nature, this and that, okay? Because you are already familiar with the personal. Whereas that individual poem may not have anything to deal as such with his love of nature. Got it? So, we have to remove the author and look at the text. This is what I.A. Richards and Eliot introduced and indicated and it was, I always argue, carried to an extreme by the post-structuralists, death of the author and all. Here Eliot is not <laughs> killing the author but separating the author from the text, the first step. Killing will come later by the other writers. All right. So sincere criticism is always directed on poem, not the poet. And then he goes on to find fault with those poets or those definers of poetry whose definitions gave rise to this kind of problem of confliction between the poet and the poem. And his prime target is William Wordsworth.
who said, Poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, having their emotion, having their roots in emotions recollected in tranquility. Spontaneous overflow. Like we, you know, suddenly sing aloud, burst into laughter. So he says, poetry is a spontaneous overflow. Eliot said that is a very immature definition of poetry. Poetry is more of an art. That is what he indicated. You have to know the trick of the trade. It cannot be spontaneous. It cannot be, you know, emotional. And uh, in addition, he says, poetry is not a turning loose of emotions, but an escape from emotions. It is not an expression of personality, but an escape from personality. That is, the better an artist is, the more separate in him will be the mind which creates and the mind which suffers. So that is why when you read William Orsworth's poems, in most cases, there is no difference between the poet and the narrator. We, you know, basically teach these things. Narrator is not the poet. And the, but if in romantic poetry, mostly, it is very difficult because the poet talks in his own person. But in Eliot's poem, you look at Wasteland. You look at uh, J. Alfred Prufrock. He has himself exemplified what he preached. So the narrator is very, very impersonal. You cannot say that this is Eliot saying, Eliot speaking, okay, in Eliot's poems. That you can say so in Warsaw, even in Yeats. Though Yeats was a modernist, he was not like Eliot and Pound. He had more personal investments. So, okay, uh, this thing that poetry is not an expression of personality or emotion. It is an escape from both. Then, carrying it a little further, he brings the analogy of certain chemical reactions you know, certain chemical reactions take place when only a catalyst is there. Catalyst is that element which does not get changed, but which affects, which brings change in the two other or two or more other chemicals during the interaction. So, if I can give an example, say a simple example, because most of us are not from science background, uh, generally we may, we make uh, from milk, when the uh, from milk we prepare say this thing, what we call poneer actually cottage cheese, but cottage cheese is not an exact translation poneer or chana is there. So you add some uh, tamarind or lemon, squeeze lemon in the lemon or tamarind actually doesn't get changed, but it changes the milk into cottage cheese, something like that. So the poet is someone who himself should not get changed by poetry. In his mind, which is like a space, traditions, cultures, contemporary happenings, feelings, all come together and, you know, as if, according to Eliot, they have a play within themselves and entirely new thing comes out. So poet's mind is just a space. He should not influence his emotions, uh, influence the poem or his creation why his emotion is feeling all that I hope you have not understood but there is criticism if that is so then why everyone cannot write poetry if the mind is a space you know if it has no interference you know why it's a poetry yes so the answer is catalyst catalyst brings change but it itself does not get changed that is the answer Yes, so everyone does not have the power of a catalyst. Everything cannot act as a catalyst in chemical reaction. Some elements can. Similarly, all people, though they have their experience enough, they don't have this power to mold. So that is why uh, they are different. But finally, yes, the truth is that, according to Eliot, again I am saying, please don't think that this is the final statement about poetry or general truth about poetry. There are many more things to be said. But network is slow. Even a 15 minutes video takes for me 4 to 5 hours to upload and that is painful. So I want to shorten it in brief uh, to recapitulate that tradition is not a fixed thing. It is a heritage. And yes, one important thing Eliot says, I forgot before to tell you, that a tradition cannot be inherited. It is not like your father's well that he dies and you get it immediately. 
you know cultural tradition or the tradition that he says it has to be acquired by labor so even if you are born in a say hindu tradition islamic tradition or bengali tradition or arabic tradition unless you work hard to know that tradition you will not be an automatic inheritor of the tradition that is what it says so it cannot be inherited you must work hard to achieve it and then through your individual talent you can bring changes in it i will give the example of tilak lokamanya tilak to make it a more lucid he was one of the great figures of indian nationalism or the founding father so you know before tilak the ganapati puja or ganapati festivals in maharashtra not festival puja they were only mainly spiritual or religious things that ganesh utsav but tilak mobilized it into a national movement anti british movement the ganesh puja pandals would be there but they will be more used for national you know spirit lectures speeches talking against the british networking without you know criticizing ganesh puja and so that is extension of tradition so that is lokamanya tilaks uh, balganga tilaks individual talent a similar things happened with durga puja in bengal this was you know durga puja was used both for pleasing the british at one point of time by the babus doing lot of festivities festivities and then later the same was appropriated by nationalists like bonkim chandra and um, arubind even tego though he was a brahmo the image of the mother goddess as equivalent to the nation comes keeps recurring in his poems like in the famous song aji bangladesh er hriday hote kokhon apuni etc etc innumerable so these are all instances of individual talent so tradition and the individual talent both are malleable they inform each other and then secondly in the second part you must learn to separate the art from the artist you should criticize the artist sorry criticize the art not the artist i'm very sorry criticize art not the artist you know you may compare it to your model codes of election before every election some model guidelines are given by election commission that all parties are authorized to criticize the activities of other parties or leaders but not their personal lives okay and uh, it is a very good thing that all parties follow this and we have a very nice uh, election so <laughs> that is like that elliot's formula he should praise or criticize the poem not the poet that is his thing how far it is possible well that is another story that is up to you to take or judge i and here today i am looking for academic uh, dialogue actually this is purely non commercial only academic so what i want is comments you know your addition not to say that my lecture is good or whatever but you know what you want to say you want to add more that way you know it's a learning process dialogue takes place and then i also learn you also learn again like tradition and individual talent thank you